Well, originally, uh, much of the work on international trade concentrated on trade between countries in sectors, uh, such as chemicals versus electronics and the like. The new trade theory that was developed by Paul Krugman and myself emphasized instead the role of individual firms. And this emphasis provided additional explanations to trade patterns and in particular uh, enabled us to explain phenomena that previously one could not explain. In addition, this served as foundations for the more recent development of international trade that emphasizes firm heterogeneity, which was originally developed by my colleague, uh, Mark Melitz. The role of multinational corporations in trade uh, has been important for many years, including in the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. However, their role has grown in uh, recent decades, and they have become dominant players in international trade. Uh, in the early 80s, the type of theory of multinational that I have developed was integrated into the new view of trade that emphasizes the role of the firm. And again, as a result, it enabled us to explain a variety of phenomena that could not be explained earlier on. And more recently, with the advent of the new line of thinking that emphasizes firm heterogeneity, my colleague Paul Antras and I have developed a theory of multinationals that brings in many new elements into the thinking about the subject, such as the role of legal institutions in the conduct of foreign direct investment and the trade flows within multinational corporations. It is important to understand the investment strategies of multinationals and moreover the sourcing strategies of both domestic and multinational firms in order to understand the operation of the global economy. What has happened in the last few decades is that due to the fact that the value chain has been truncated in many ways, Firms now source their inputs from many different sources. And this sourcing has become a major determinant of both the location of production and the structure of international trade and foreign direct investment. Among the many determinants of these locations are, of course, cost considerations, such as places where wages are low, in particularly adjusted for productivity. But because firms have to rely on local suppliers, they care very much about the nature of local supply chains and the ability to contract with local suppliers. So these are sort of new determinants of foreign direct investment and the global supply chains. Cumulative innovation generates knowledge of two types. On the one hand, it produces new products and new production techniques, and on the other hand, it produces knowledge that proves to be very useful in R&D in future innovations. As a result, even when firms invest in order to develop new products or new production techniques, they at the same time contribute to general knowledge on which other firms build in their innovative activities. This generates a cycle of growth in which cumulative R&D investment 
generates future growth. And importantly, there is a strong interdependence across countries in this accumulation of knowledge in the sense that a country's stock of knowledge depends not only on its own R&D, but also on research and development done by its trade partners. As a result, there is strong interdependence in growth processes of industrial countries and middle-income countries, and as a result also the growth rate for the world economy. Well, in a globalized market, obviously, individual countries can play a bigger or smaller role depending on how large they are and the degree to which they are integrated in the global economy. So if we take a country like the U.S., for example, whose output accounts close to a quarter of the global economy's output, then many of its policies impact other countries which, are, which trade with the U.S. or with other countries that the U.S. has economic relations with. On the other hand, very small countries have a relatively small or negligible income on the global economy. However, countries can become more important players if they become members of a trading bloc, such as the European Union or in North America, Canada, the U.S., and Mexico that form the NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. And there has been a tendency for countries to build up these blocks in order to gain access to bigger markets within the block and use the block in order to get access to bigger markets in other countries as well. In many countries, special interest groups lobby governments for the formation of trade policies. This is true for trade policies, but also for many other policies, such as environmental policies, labor policies, and the like. In the area of trade policies, the final outcome depends very much on who participates in this political process. As a result, if the protectionist forces in a country are organized and well-funded and they lobby for protection, and on the other side there is very little organization, then the outcome typically will be more protection. Importantly, however, the rate of protection of industries depends on sectoral characteristics, and the theory and empirics that have been developed in order to assess this outcome emphasize a variety of sectoral characteristics that impact the final rate of protection. Fortunately for the theory, it finds support in many empirical studies in different countries, such as the US, Australia, or Turkey. I'm not aware of an impact in political areas, but the fact of the matter is that many of the international institutions re rely on the analytical framework that my colleagues and I have developed. 